Hey, you guys. I just was about to remind Pastor Jeff on the way up here, but I didn't quite get to it, that I believe two of the times that I have spoken in Sunday night church, we had a tornado. So not to scare you, but those sort of things do follow me around. Okay, so just settle in for a wild ride tonight. I'm so excited to be with you guys tonight as we continue our Don't Be a Grinch series. If you're joining us online, I'm excited to have you as well. We're all one big family here, no matter where we are. God brings us together, right? Now, I've got a question for you. Has anyone ever seen one of these? Look closely. Do you know what this is? It's a beanie baby, my friends, okay? And when I was a kid, oh, not yet, not that one yet. Tricky, tricky. Well, I guess you can leave her up. She's kind of cute. I'll get to her in a minute. Now, when I was a kid, I collected Beanie Babies. And I remember they were $5.99, and I would save up $6, and then I would get another one, and six more dollars, and get another one, because I loved them. I was crazy for them at that time. In the 90s, everybody wanted Beanie Babies. Do you remember that they would have them at McDonald's? Does anybody remember that in, in the, like the kids meal? And people would literally, it was like on the news, that people would go crazy and like wait for hours and buy 30 Happy Meals to get them. I mean, it was just nuts. And I collected these. I had a lot of them, as much as $6 at a time could buy. And that was my collection. Now, I remember a few years ago, my mom pulled out a very, very large tub of Beanie Babies and said, we're going to sell these at a garage sale. Pick your favorites. This is it. We're not storing these anymore. So I picked my favorites. This guy was one of them. And the rest we sold. So I'm kind of over that phase of life. But I wanted to share with you guys tonight that a lot of people collect things, don't we? don't we? Is there anybody in here that collects, that has a collection, something special to you? What do you collect, Vicki? It was bears. Oh, Boyd's bears. My grandma had a very large collection of Boyd's bears. She passed them on to me. I was lucky. Anybody else have something they collect? Lily. Rocks? Girl, you and me should talk rocks sometime. I had a very big collection also poured out while I was at college, so watch for that. Okay. Anybody else have something they collect? Yes. Susie? Antique tins. All right. So there's things that we collect. We collect things all the time. Now, of all the things we collect, you can kind of see from my friend that was flashed up on the screen, have you ever known somebody that like collects, collects? You know, they are serious collectors. That first lady, I want to put her back up. How many of you have ever collected stuffed animals? Like me, stuffies, bears. We have a large collection at our house. Now, the largest collection of teddy bears belongs to Jackie Miley in the USA. It consists of, get this, 8,026 bears. And that was the world record in 2012. So either this lady, I don't know, she's lost somewhere in a sea of bears, or she has more now. I bet she has more. That's a crazy number of bears, isn't it? How about sports cards? Nobody said sports cards. You collect baseball cards or football cards. Are basketball cards a thing? I think so. Now, this next guy, this record was just recently broken, actually, by Paul Jones in Idaho. He is the proud owner of the largest private collection of baseball cards in the world with 2.8 million cards. And get this, you guys, their value is estimated at between 50 million and 100 million dollars for baseball cards. Do you think that guy actually knows all the cards he has? I don't know. I don't know. All right, one more because it's awesome. All right. How many of you like a nice cold can or bottle of Coke? My dad's a big Coca-Cola drinker. He raised us that that was the only way to go. So check out this guy. This is the most hilarious one to me. Okay. At the last count, this was confirmed in August 2013, Coke lover David Andriani was in possession of a record 10,558 single brand cans from 87 countries, setting a new Guinness World Records title for largest collection of soft drink cans, same brand. Did you know that was a thing? It's a thing, okay. A whole room of empty soda cans. At our house, we call that recycling, right? <laughs> That is dedication, you guys. But of all these pictures, when I look at them, it brings up a good question. And that question is, when is enough enough? 
Have you ever thought about that? When is enough enough? When you're collecting something, at what point has your collection gotten so big that you no longer need any more of your collection? Or does it ever stop? Will you always need one more Beanie Baby to sell at a garage sale? Would you always need one more teddy bear or baseball card or unique soda can? <laughs> and more important than that, we have to start wondering if it's possible that the quest for more might be keeping us from something more important. Hmm. Now, whether we collect something or not, these questions are good for us to think about, especially as we're going into the Christmas season and some of us might be thinking about what's going to be under the tree, what kind of presents we hope to open on Christmas morning. What's great, though, is when we have big questions, there's always a place where we can look for answers. Am I right, Nicolettos? There's always a place to look for answers. It's a collection of books, poems, and letters called what? Ding, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner. The Bible, okay? Now tonight, we're going to be looking in the book of Luke. You can tell from my little arrow. Chapter 12, starting in verse 13. And I wasn't going to do this. But the mood has struck me, okay? So we're going to do a little something old school, but we do it every single Sunday, and that's called a sword drill. Have you ever heard of that before? Now, I know you're not supposed to be prideful, but I get pretty puffed up when I see all of our kids at camp or an event, and they are the fastest looker-uppers you will find. For real. So a sword drill is basically when there is a verse that I'm going to tell you guys to look up, and you use your super fast fingers, and you look that up as fast as you possibly can. And the first one that finds it, if you've been in my class, you know you stand up and say the first word. Should we do it? Okay. Let's do it. All right, ready? We're going to look up Luke chapter 12. That's the big number. Little number 13, starting... Now, go, 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 go. Da, 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 <gasps> What? Good job. All right. Keep looking. Keep looking. I had my Bible marker in because, spoiler alert, I knew we were talking about this. I'm speaking. Okay. Luke chapter 12. Very good, Steve McMullen. Starting in verse 13. Okay. So let's find out what Jesus wanted, to know about, wanted us to know about God's plan for our stuff. This story is what we call a parable, okay? And in kids' church, we refer to a parable in a certain way, and I told the kids this morning that I was going to ask for somebody to tell me the meaning of a parable, and I think Ryder Nicoletto is the brave one. Do you remember, Ryder? Come here, hurry. You got your red fast shoes on. All right, Ryder, can you tell everybody what is a parable? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Ba bam, that's right. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Guess what? You know how I said I'd give you a dollar? Pastor Jeff only had 10 bucks. It's your lucky day. <laughs> I said it must have been meant to be. So, a parable what we call in kids' church an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Okay, it tells us about regular things, but it teaches us about God. A little history lesson before we begin this parable today. In Jesus' day, an inheritance is what you receive from your parents after they croaked. Okay? And it was a little bit of a bummer, but older kids, like Gabe, would usually get more than the younger kids, like Austin. Sorry, Austin. Okay? And what you would usually get was like money, animals, hip hooray, a position of power. And Jesus was speaking when a man says, hey, Jesus, I need you to do something for me. And we know that most likely this guy was a little brother. And you'll be able to tell from what he says to Jesus and the problem that he has. He says in verse 13, and I'll get these up for you in the NIRV. Someone in the crowd spoke to Jesus. Teacher, he said, tell my brother to divide the family property with me. Little brother. <laughs> so this is a tense moment. But basically, this guy was saying, Jesus, you make my brother give me more of his stuff. I want more of his stuff. And Jesus' response was really interesting. It was probably a little bit surprising to the man. Here's what he says. In verse 14, Jesus replied, friend, who made me judge or empire between you? Don't you like when Jesus gets a little bit like holy sass? He's like, who made me in charge of you, right? But Jesus continues in verse 15. 
Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against wanting to have more and more things. Life is not made up of how much a person has. And as if that wasn't enough, Jesus goes on to tell a parable, right, writer? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning to illustrate his point. And it went something like this. Okay, so this parable is about a rich man. And what we know about this rich man is that he was a farmer. E-I-E-I-O. I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist, right? Okay. So we know that a farmer needs a place to store his crops, like a barn or a silo. So I just happen to have a nice silo right here. Here you go, farmer. Stay. Okay. Okay. So after a good harvest, this farmer stores his crops in his barn. Got some crops here. Probably not like any crops you've ever seen. Oh, I'm not a very good farmer. I can't get all my crops in there. Okay. So he stores his crops in his barn. This guy's set. He's good to go. He has all that he needs. Well, the next year, we read in this parable, that this man plants his crops again. And it's not just a good year. It's a really good year. So when the crops grow, it's time to cash in, except the problem is that his barn's still full from last year. Hmm. So Jesus says in verse 16 and 17, let's look. A certain rich man's land produced a very good crop. He thought to himself, what should I do? I don't have any place to store my crops. So this guy has all of these crops, more crops than he could ever use in a lifetime. Okay, what do you think he should do? He should share them? Okay, good idea, Ryder. He could sell it? Okay, now, these are great ideas, but unfortunately, that's not so much what he did. Okay? Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger ones, and I'll store my extra grain in them. So what does he do? He gets a bigger... Barn. Mm, mm. Bigger. Oh, mm. He didn't die yet. That's the end. Uh, okay, so mm. he gets a bigger barn. To store more crops. Mm, right? Mm. So instead of shearing them, instead of giving them away, even though he had more crops than he could ever use in his lifetime, if you study this. And the words that they use, we can read in God's word that he has more crops than he could ever use in a lifetime. Okay? So he tears down his perfectly good barn. See ya. And he builds a bigger one. Okay? Now there's room for more. But is enough enough? What about next year's harvest? Where will that go? That's a good question, Diana. I'm glad you asked. Hold up a second. Oh, perfect. Someone must have left this for me. Okay. So, once again, let's see what happens. The man continued. In verse 19, he said, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain stored away for many years. Okay. And he fills up an even bigger barn. Good thing I warned Pastor Jeff the key words, packing peanuts. Now he says to himself, I have plenty of grain stored away for many years. I'll take life easy. Eat, drink, and have a good time. In other words, what's this guy planning to do with all he collected? He's going to keep it for himself, right? He's going to use all of it to make his life very comfortable. However, God was not pleased with this man's actions, and he had some very strong words for him, as we can see in verse 20. God says, you foolish man! Tonight I will take your life away from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Now let's think about this guy for a moment. Was he a bad guy just because he had a good crop? 
No, Aiden, he was not. <laughs> nope. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you look back through this story, the rich man missed a lot of chances to give. And after Jesus tells this parable, he gives these final words. He says in verse 21, This is how it will be for whoever stores things away from themselves, but is not rich in the sight of God. I think it goes, it's good to go back and read what Jesus said at the beginning of the story. He says in verse 15, watch out, be on your guard against wanting to have more and more things. Life is not made up of how much a person has. You see, the man had worked so hard at getting more and more and more, he never thought, bing, he never had that light come on that maybe those crops weren't just make, to make his life easier, but maybe they could be shared with others. Instead of building bigger barns to store more than he could possibly ever use, he could have given away what he didn't have room for. It doesn't have to be grain or beanie babies or baseball cards or soda cans. It can really be about anything we set our sights on so hard that it starts to keep us from giving to others. When we cling to us, our stuff so tightly, it can be really hard to give stuff away. So I'm sure we can tell from this story that giving is important to God. And because it's important to God, it should be important to us. But the question is, why? Why is it important to give? Jesus told this story to remind us that people are more important than stuff, like family, friends, neighbors. I'm sure we've all heard this before. But we don't always get it right, do we? Uh -uh. We still fight. We still complain when we have less than someone else when they have a bigger house, a bigger car, more stuff. We hang on to what's ours till we figure out how can we get more instead of sharing with others. This is called greed, and it reminds me of this guy. Mm. Oh, mm. But you know what? It also reminds me of me. You might hear the word greed and think, not me. <laughs> I love God. I am not greedy. But I want you to listen to this definition today and see if a piece of it might be true for you. You ready? The definition of greed is an excessive desire to acquire or possess more than what one needs or deserves, especially with respect to material wealth. Hmm. <laughs> You know what makes this time of year hard for greedy people? Is that we're going to add to the pile of what we already have that we arguably don't need. There are things I want that I don't need. And most of us are actually going to receive things that we don't need and we don't want. <laughs> it's true. Sorry, Mom. In our incredibly affluent culture in North America, the problem of greed runs even deeper than we realize, and it can be very sneaky. There's a very fine line we tread as parents in helping our kids celebrate Christmas. I know when I was a kid, I had like so much delight to open my Christmas presents on Christmas morning because let's face it, what kid doesn't like presents, am I right? What adult doesn't like presents, am I right? So how do you as a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, how do you keep from inadvertently fueling greed in your family this Christmas? Hmm. There's a few options I thought of. Don't give out presents, hand out coal, read Deuteronomy and pretend it's February. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> but those are probably recipes that would most likely kill the joy of Christmas, so probably not the best idea. In my experience instead, the very best antidote to greed I've discovered is generosity. I'm going to say that again. The best antidote to greed in your family, in your life, is generosity. The more I give, the more I cut down deeper into that greed inside of me. The more I'm willing to take giving to a sacrificial level, meaning to the point where our family is not doing things because we're giving that income away. The more I'm reminded that life is not about me. It's not about my wants. It's not about my desires. By far, generous giving is the antidote to greed that lives inside of me. We can make a difference in choosing differently than the world around us. We can make a different choice than our more is more culture. 
This morning in Kids Church, this was so perfect, you guys. We read Matthew 20, the parable of the vineyard. And at the end, Matthew 20, verse 15, Jesus says, and I'm sure you've heard this before, that the last will be first and the first will be last. And I have to tell you, that was mind-blowing 2,000 years later as it was for them in Bible times. I mean, the kids, every time we read something like that, are like, what? What? What'd you say? That doesn't seem right. That's because we live in a culture that screams, me first, me first. But we need to be raising kids that say, you're right. Not what I expected, you expected me to say. What I mean is, we need to raise kids to say, you're right, it is you first. And it's me second. And not because we want our kids to be kicked dad and low on the totem pole, no parent wants that. But it's because we want our kids to be humble and generous and a servant to all. And they get there through generosity, not because it's easy, not because it feels good, but because it's right. We need to look for ways to be generous. And what I want you to hear tonight what we learn from this parable is if, there, if we're not careful, we'll miss our opportunity. That farmer, he wasn't a bad guy, but he missed it. He missed it. God blessed him, and he missed his chance to give. Don't miss your chance to give. As Christmas approaches, ask yourself this question. What am I doing to stifle greed in my family this Christmas? Maybe you could sponsor a family in need. Maybe you could donate or serve in a local mission over the holidays. This might look a little bit different right now, but there's still ways to do that. Talk to your kids about how as a family you've decided to give first, save second, and live on the rest. I could preach a whole sermon just on that. Make sure that giving is part of your life the whole year. Make it a weekly practice, not just a seasonal pursuit. I'm going to say that again. Make your giving a weekly practice, not just a seasonal pursuit. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents growing up, and hallelujah, they shaped who I am. And they had a quote by Winston Churchill up in their house that I will never forget. When I think about giving, this is burned on my mind, and maybe you know this quote. It said, we make a living by what we give. No, 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 no. I said it was burned in my mind. How funny. That'll get you. We make a living by what we get but we make a life by what we give. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And that is burned in my mind, mostly, as you could see. Because that was a way of life for our family. That's the way my parents were raised. That's the way my grandparents were raised. All year long, we looked for ways to give. It wasn't always fun, but it was right. Work with your kids to incorporate giving as part of their regular rhythm and make giving a celebration in their life. Did you know in Kids Church every single week we listen to Celebration by Cool and the Gang? Uh, I bet you didn't. Uh, but if this comes on, your kid's going to let you know, oh, I know this song. This is our offering song. Uh, celebrate good times, come on. Uh, but that's not the reason why we listen to it, Pastor Carrie. Uh, we always listen to this song right after our worship because giving is simply another way to worship God. It shouldn't make us grumpy. It should be a celebration. We don't give because we have to. We give because we get to. Hallelujah. And that's what we're raising our kids here to know. We are blessed to be a blessing. We give cheerfully because we have the opportunity to give. And we celebrate our giving. Make that a part of your family and your life. I want to show you what happened to a different guy when he gave. <laughs> I love that. That's my favorite part. When the Grinch realized Christmas wasn't about what you get, but what you give, what happened to his heart? It almost exploded. I'm glad I'm far away from you because I just spat so far. I exploded. <laughs> I also love in the movie where he says, maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, he thought, means a little bit more. And you know what? I think he took a line from Jesus there. Huh? You know, that's God's way all along. Huh. Christmas does mean more. And you know what, it's cool, what is so cool? Is that God increases our love, our joy, our kindness, our peace, the more that we give. You know, our heart growth is directly tied to our giving. Mm -hmm. 
Because when we give, it grows our heart. All I know tonight, guys, and I'm almost done, is I can be greedy, and maybe you can too. And the best way to tackle that in my life is to give away a noticeable portion of the things God has given to me. So whatever you do this season, don't miss your chance to give. I love what it says in 1 Timothy 6, 8. Command the rich to do what's good. Tell them to be rich in doing good things. They must give freely and be willing to share. They must give freely. They must be willing to share. So share when you've got something to share. God's way is simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Share when you've got something to share. Show love when you've got someone you can show love to. Take time to practice generosity by giving. That rich man in the parable, he missed his chance. Makes me sad for him. I don't think he was a bad guy. But he missed his chance to give and decided to keep everything for himself. And because of that choice, he faced a pretty severe consequence. It was kind of a spoiler alert at the beginning. It cost him his life. When God gives us something, he expects us to use that blessing to bless others. We don't have to be selfish and keep it for ourselves. We can show generosity. We can give some of it away. What I want you to remember tonight is this. The best antidote to greed is generosity. So don't miss your chance to give. Don't miss it. Let's be generous. Let's look for ways to give and share with others. I gave you some practical ways to do that tonight. But I know that God always has something that is unique and special to you that he wants to drop in your heart. And I don't believe anybody is here or watching by mistake. It's because God wants to speak to you. And so tonight, we're just going to take a few minutes, the best part of Sunday night service, and we're going to focus on a few things in prayer. The first one we're going to do tonight is pray this. Jesus, examine my heart. Show me the ways I need to become more like you tonight. That might have to do with generosity. That might be something totally different. That God has your attention and he wants to say, oh, I've been waiting till you were listening so I could tell you this. God, how can I become more like you tonight? And second, I don't want to miss my chance to give. Jesus, show me what that looks like for our family. Maybe that spe involves a specific person. Maybe that involves a specific amount you've been setting aside. It could be anything. But what I want you to understand tonight is that when we give, it changes us. And it makes us more like Christ. And that's what we hunger for. That's what we want. So let's seek God in prayer for these things for just a few minutes. And after we do, I'm going to pray for our OCC boxes. I'm going to have you guys join me in praying for those, praying for the destiny of where they're going to end up, the children that they're going to have, um, open them, and also our Thanksgiving baskets this week. We're going to take a few minutes to pray for the families that those are going to go to. So let's take a, just a few minutes and just ask God to examine our hearts. That's always good to do. And just ask him to show us what he wants us to give this year. Can we do that? Oh, God. 
Jesus, I pray right now that you, who are a revealer of, of secrets and mysteries, God, that you would reveal to us, God, what we need to change in our hearts tonight, whether that's about generosity, whether that's something completely different, God. Our attention is on you. Our focus is on you. Show us ways that we can be more like you tonight, God. That's why we're here. We don't want to leave the same tonight, God. We want to be more like you when we leave tonight than when we came in. Jesus, show us the ways we can become more like you, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you refine us. You refine our hearts, God. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. You're so good, God. You're so good. We don't deserve it, God, but you're so good. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Next, why don't we just ask God to reveal to, to us what he wants us to do. Maybe in your family, ask your kids. They are so wise. I can't even tell you some of the things that come out of their mouth that just floor me. Jesus, show us what generosity looks like for our family at this time, at this moment. whether that's a, a family to bless God or a certain thing you want us to do, Lord Jesus. We don't want to miss out, God. We don't want to miss out. Oh, you're good, God. You're good, you're good, you're good, you're good. God, I just thank you that your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts, God. But we want to follow your ways and we want to know your thoughts. Hallelujah. So, Lord, start a work in us, God. You already have plans in place, God, and we get to be a part of what you're doing. Thank you, God. Let our families be a blessing. Show us what you want us to do, God. Let us be your hands and feet. Let us see with your eyes, God. Hear with your ears, Jesus, to do your work. Best work we can do in this life. Help us not to miss it, Jesus. Help us not to miss it, God. You know what, guys? This is a prayer you can even pray every day when you wake up in the morning. Mm, let me be a blessing, God. Let me be a blessing. Let the words that I speak be give, giving life uh, to those around me. Mm. We don't have to give money to be a blessing. Mm. We have so much that we can give. Before we pray for these OCC boxes and our Thanksgiving baskets this week, I just want to encourage you as we were praying, I'm just reminded of so many times as a kid, that my parents made the extra effort to give. Even sometimes when it hurt, even sometimes when my brother and sister and I had a bad attitude about it. But when I look back, those are the things that shaped me in life, that I know down deep were God's heart. Those are the things I will not forget, the things that steered me in maybe a different direction than I would have gone otherwise. 
So I want to encourage you, don't miss your chance. Don't miss your chance. Spiritual leaders of the family, don't miss it. Because your kids are going to grow up to be world changers by changing the world right now. Let's reach out our hands and pray over these boxes. Let's pray over our Thanksgiving baskets this week because the coolest thing about God is he has a plan and a purpose in all things, that he knows the name of every child and every family that will receive. He knows what they need. He knows the miracles that they are praying for. And the best part about this is we get to be a part of what God's doing. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we pray your spirit and your blessing on all these gifts that are going out from New Hope this week. We thank you, Jesus, that we get to be a part of what you're doing. It's not about us. It's not me first. It's you first, Jesus. And I get to bless others because you have blessed me. And so we pray, God, that all of these boxes, these baskets would be such a blessing, God, that even now you would set up so many divine appointments, hallelujah, that this would be a testimony of your goodness and your grace to the people that receive, Lord Jesus, that this wouldn't just be about a box, that it wouldn't be about a basket, but Lord Jesus, it would be confirmation of your love of your faithfulness, hallelujah, that the stories that would come out would be a testimony not of what we do, but of who you are, Jesus. We pray, God, through these things received that hearts and minds would come to know you, that they would be changed forever, that you would redirect the eternal destiny of the children that received these boxes. I thank you, God, that you have a plan and a purpose. And whatever the enemy has planned, he will not be able to prevail against what you have planned. And so we we also pray your hedge of protection around the people that receive these, God. Around the gifts inside here, God, because we know they're so much more than a gift. They are a supernatural confirmation of your blessing and your heart. We pray for the children and families that receive this, God, that our greatest prayer would be that they would know you more, that they would hunger and thirst for you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, God, that you bless us so we can be a blessing. We love you so much, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you guys so much. So much. Thank you for letting me share with you tonight and make a little mess. That's my favorite thing. Not so much the cleanup, but, you know, it's part of it. I hope you guys have a fabulous Thanksgiving. Remember, we are having a Thanksgiving family service right here on Wednesday night. We'd love to have you join us for that and celebrate and be thankful. I know I'm thankful for you. I thank God for you. I hope you have a wonderful night. We'll see you soon. Little wave. Bye. Bye.